After the conclusion of the French War, our tribe had nothing to trouble it till the commencement of the revolution. For twelve or fifteen years the use of the implements of war was not known, nor the war whoop heard, save on days of festivity, when the achievements of former times were commemorated in a kind of mimic warfare, in which the chiefs and warriors displayed their prowess, and illustrated their former adroitness, by laying the ambuscade, surpassing their enemies, and performing many accurate manoeuvres with the tomahawk and scalping knife, thereby preserving and handing to their children the theory of Indian warfare. During that period, they also pertinaciously observed the religious rites of their progenitors, by attending with the most scrupulous exactness and a great degree of enthusiasm to the sacrifices, at particular times, to appease the anger of the evil deity, or to excite the commiseration and friendship of the great good spirit, whom they adored with reverence as the author, governor, supporter and disposer of every good thing of which they participated. They also practised in various athletic games, such as running, wrestling, leaping and playing ball, with a view that their bodies might be more supple, or rather that they might not become enervated, and that they might be enabled to make a proper selection of chiefs for the councils of the nation and leaders for war. While the Indians were thus engaged in their round of traditionary performances, with the addition of hunting, their women attended to agriculture, their families and a few domestic concerns of small consequence, and attended with but little labour. No people can live more happy than the Indians did in times of peace, before the introduction of spirituous liquors amongst them. Their lives were a continual round of pleasures. Their wants were few and easily satisfied, and their cares were only for today, the bounds of their calculations for future comfort not extending to the incalculable uncertainties of tomorrow. If peace ever dwelt with men, it was in former times, in the recesses from war, amongst what are now termed barbarians. The moral character of the Indians was, if I may be allowed the expression, uncontaminated. Their fidelity was perfect and became proverbial. They were strictly honest. They despised deception and falsehood, and chastity was held in high veneration, and a violation of it was considered sacrilege. They were temperate in their desires, moderate in their passions, and candid and honourable in the expression of their sentiments on every subject of importance. Thus, at peace amongst themselves, and with the neighbouring whites, though there were none at that time very near, our Indians lived quietly and peaceably at home, till a little before the breaking out of the Revolutionary War, when they were sent for, together with the chiefs and members of the Six Nations generally by the people of the States, to go to the German flats, and there hold a general council, in order that the people of the states might ascertain, in good season, who they should esteem and treat as enemies and who as friends, in the great war which was then upon the point of breaking out between them and the King of England. Our Indians obeyed the call and the council was holden, at which the pipe of peace was smoked and a treaty made, in which the six nations solemnly agreed that if a war should eventually break out, they would not take up arms on either side, but that they would observe a strict neutrality. With that the people of the states were satisfied, as they had not asked their assistance nor did not wish it. The Indians returned to their homes well pleased that they could live on neutral ground, surrounded by the din of war without being engaged in it. About a year passed off, and we as usual were enjoying ourselves in the employments of peaceable times, when a messenger arrived from the British commissioners, requesting all the Indians of our tribe to attend a general council, which was soon to be held at Oswego. The council convened, and being opened, the British commissioners informed the chiefs that the object of calling a council of the Six Nations was to engage their assistance in subduing the rebels, the people of the states, who had risen up against the good king, their master, and were about to rob him of a great part of his possessions and wealth, and added that they would amply reward them for all their services. The chiefs then arose and informed the commissioners of the nature and extent of the treaty, which they had entered into with the people of the states the year before, and that they should not violate it by taking up the hatchet against them. The commissioners continued their entreaties without success, till they addressed their avarice, by telling our people that the people of the states were few in number and easily subdued and that on the account of their disobedience to the king, they justly merited all the punishment that it was possible for white men and Indians to inflict upon them, and added that the king was rich and powerful, both in money and subjects, 
that his rum was as plenty as the water in Lake Ontario, that his men were as numerous as the sands upon the lake shore, and that the Indians, if they would assist in the war and persevere in their friendship to the king till it was closed, should never want for money or goods. Upon this the chiefs concluded a treaty with the British commissioners, in which they agreed to take up arms against the rebels and continue in the service of his majesty till they were subdued, in consideration of certain conditions which were stipulated in the treaty to be performed by the British government and its agents. As soon as the treaty was finished, the commissioners made a present to each Indian of a suit of clothes, a brass kettle, a gun and tomahawk, a scalping knife, a quantity of powder and lead, a piece of gold, and promised a bounty on every scalp that should be brought in. Thus richly clad and equipped, they returned home after an absence of about two weeks, full of the fire of war and anxious to encounter their enemies. Many of the kettles which the Indians received at that time are now in use on the Genesee Flats. Hired to commit depredations upon the whites, who had given them no offence, they waited impatiently to commence their labour, till some time in the spring of 1776, when a convenient opportunity offered for them to make an attack. At that time, a party of our Indians were at Kautigar, who shot a man that was looking after his horse for the sole purpose, as I was informed by my Indian brother, who was present, of commencing hostilities. In May following, our Indians were in their first battle with the Americans, but at what place I am unable to determine. While they were absent at that time, my daughter Nancy was born. The same year, at Cherry Valley, our Indians took a woman and her three daughters prisoners and brought them on, leaving one at Canandaigua, one at Honioi, one at Cataraugus, and one, the woman, at Little Beardstown, where I resided. The woman told me that she and her daughters might have escaped, but that they expected the British army only, and therefore made no effort. Her husband and sons got away. Some time having elapsed, they were redeemed at Fort Niagara by Cole Butler, who clothed them well, and sent them home. In the same expedition, Joseph Smith was taken prisoner at or near Cherry Valley, brought to Genesee, and detained till after the Revolutionary War. He was then liberated, and the Indians made him a present, in company with Horatio Jones, of 6,000 acres of land lying in the present town of Leicester, in the county of Livingston. One of the girls just mentioned was married to a British officer at Fort Niagara by the name of Johnson, who at the time she was taken took a gold ring from her finger, without any compliments or ceremonies. When he saw her at Niagara he recognised her features, restored the ring that he had so impolitely borrowed, and courted and married her. Previous to the battle at Fort Stanwix, the British sent for the Indians to come and see them whip the rebels and at the same time stated that they did not wish to have them fight, but wanted to have them just sit down, smoke their pipes and look on. Our Indians went to a man, but contrary to their expectation, instead of smoking and looking on, they were obliged to fight for their lives, and in the end of the battle were completely beaten, with a great loss in killed and wounded. Our Indians alone had 36 killed, and a great number wounded. Our town exhibited a scene of real sorrow and distress, when our warriors returned and recounted their misfortunes and stated the real loss they had sustained in the engagement. The mourning was excessive and was expressed by the most doleful yells, shrieks and howlings and by inimitable gesticulations. During the revolution, my house was the home of Coles, Butler and Brandt whenever they chanced to come into our neighbourhood as they passed to and from Fort Niagara, which was the seat of their military operations. Many and many a night I have pounded samp for them from sunset till sunrise, and furnished them with necessary provision and clean clothing for their journey, 